This is what Red Bull's season has looked like so far this year. This is what Aston Martin's season has looked like. Not bad, considering that they're both one-car teams. But when we look at how McLaren's season has gone, it's a little bit more interesting. During testing for the 2023 season, McLaren were obviously in big trouble. Slow in the high-speed corners, slow in the straights, and slow to get on the power. And come the first race of the season in Bahrain, we'd see one McLaren DNF and the other finish dead last. And more salt was on the way for McLaren fans as the next race in Saudi Arabia they would finish, I think it was 15th and 17th. But at the third race in Australia, things would get a little bit better and they would both manage to finish in the points after a little bit of luck, but then it would be back to 9th and 11th for the following race. Point is, me and a lot of other McLaren fans weren't too stoked. Oh, speaking of which. There. McLaren fans, baby. It's alright for me though, because I'm also a Red Bull fan, so I guess it kind of evens out. But I had pretty much written the season off for the Papaya team before the lights even went out for the first race, as did a lot of other people. But wait, now we get towards the tail end of the season and McLaren have over 200 points. Consecutive double podium finishes, a race win, pole positions, only 11 points behind the Aston Martin of Fernando Alonso. I'm sorry Lance Stroll fans, if you exist. How did a team that could barely get into the points at the beginning of the season suddenly become best of the rest? They're faster than Mercedes faster than Ferrari, faster than Aston Martin, and are almost able to legitimately bring a fight to Max Verklappen. In fact, if we look at the last three races, McLaren have outscored Red Bull 104 to 75. And you can blame Sergio for that, but still, it's crazy nonetheless, because this is the same team that I think has had five or six race weekends this year where they didn't score any points at all. Anyways, like I said during preseason testing, the problems were obvious and numerous. With McLaren CEO Zach Brown saying that they missed a lot of their development targets for 2023, and saying that they had a lot of work to do to get back to the front of the grid where they truly believed that MCL 60 belonged. So how did McLaren turn this season around? One of the craziest mid-season development curves we've ever seen. First, remember last year in 2022 when the teams unveiled their cars for the first time in Barcelona? This was our first real look at the cars after one of the biggest overhauls of the regulations in Formula 1 history. McLaren took a bit of a gamble. A lot of teams took a bit of a gamble, some bigger than others, but McLaren went with a design philosophy that was a little bit different to every other team on the grid, except Red Bull. And even though the McLaren from 2022 had its problems, it showed potential. And Red Bull experiencing the success that they had last year showed McLaren that they may be onto something, even if they didn't fully understand how to get the performance that they needed out of their car at the time. This is probably why they decided to stick with their philosophy for 2023 and continue to push in that direction as the season goes on. They knew the potential was there as Red Bull clearly showed, they just had to figure out how to get it for themselves. Like I said at the beginning of the season, the McLaren had trouble getting the power down out of the low speed corners. It was slow in the track zones. It also wasn't too quick in the high speed sections of the circuits because of bad aerodynamic efficiency which was mostly to blame on the new rule for 2023 which said that teams had to raise the ride height 15 millimeters or a little bit more than half an inch. And this is why McLaren seemed to go backwards in between the end of 2022 and the beginning of 2023. They didn't think that raising the ride height would hurt them this much but it did. Basically it all boils down to we're not making a whole lot of downforce and we're making a lot of drag. The exact opposite of what you want which is high downforce in the corners and low drag on the straights. A hard balance to find. And when a car produces a lot of drag the way that the McLaren did, the teams have to make up for that lack of straight line speed in other areas by doing things like running less extreme downforce setups. This of course will come at the expense of stability and cornering speeds, and it became a bit of a negative feedback loop that McLaren were having trouble finding their way out of. Okay, so how did they fix it though? We know why they were slow in the first place due to the poor aerodynamic efficiency. We also know that the design has potential because the only other car in the grid that's anything like it is a about to become the most dominant car of all time. Well, if we go back to Austria, where McLaren fitted Lando Norris's car with a heavy upgrade package, we can see the first signs of hope. Hope that McLaren fans really needed because going into Austria, the team had only managed to secure 17 points. 17 points in the first seven races. Lando's car was fitted with a new prototype floor, a slimmed down engine cover, as well as a completely new side pod design. And in order to make such drastic changes to the side pods and the engine covers, they also had to redesign their entire cooling package. And obviously this was a very big upgrade to be bringing to one race all at once, so they could only afford to bring enough parts for one car, which is why only Lando got the upgrades. But this meant that they would have a really good side-by-side -side comparison between the old spec McLaren and the new spec McLaren. 
iron. And it was obvious that they were moving in the right direction very early on, with Lando finishing the race in fourth place just off of the podium, and Oscar way down in 16th with the old spec. And at the next race in Silverstone, Oscar would be fitted with the same upgrades that Lando had in Austria, and Lando himself would now be also getting an upgraded front wing and a new nose design that would work better with the new floor and side pods introduced in Austria, along with some new winglets in the back to improve downforce. And just like that, McLaren jumped the field. It also helps that today in 2023, the Formula One field is as tight as it's ever been, but still, they became best of the rest seemingly over two race weekends. In Silverstone, McLaren would qualify second and third, and we would see Lando lead the race for the opening few laps before inevitably getting passed by Max. Norris would go on to stay in second and finish on the podium, though, with Oscar finishing fourth this time around. So they go from no points, no points, no points, no points, no points, no points, boom, podiums, just like that. McLaren, baby. And McLaren's return was solidified at the next race in Hungary, which was a very different circuit to Silverstone or Austria, so if they can do well here, it's a good sign. But they would do well. They would finish on the podium and they would go home with a boat of points. Boat of points? They'd go home with loads of points. All right. The final episode so far for the MCL 60 would come in Zandvoort with a new rear wing, new end plates, and a new beam wing. These improvements were aimed at further improving the car's efficiency, and that's exactly what happened. Since then, there continues to be small improvements and upgrades here and there. Some are circuit dependent, while some aren't. But overall, the team continues to make huge strides in what has been an incredible display of car development, especially in the cost cap era of Formula One, where spending is tight and resource management is so critical. Remember when I said that McLaren only scored 17 points in the first seven races. Well, in the last seven races, they've scored 160. As I record this after Qatar, the second double podium finish in a row for the team that could barely finish in the points just 10 races ago, McLaren are 11 points away from fourth in the championship behind Aston Martin, which almost looks like a guarantee with the way that the Aston has fallen off. If these upgrades had come earlier in the season, they would almost certainly be third or even second. If they had had this kind of pace from the very beginning of the season, from the onset in Bahrain, if they were this quick, Red Bull would be in a lot more trouble. I mean, this is a great time to be a McLaren fan. I haven't even talked about the new wind tunnel that they just finished. Who knows what they're going to be able to continue to achieve by the end of this season and going into the next. Right now, if anyone's going to bring a fight to Red Bull next year, it's looking like it might be McLaren. The Ferrari has its moments, and so does the Mercedes, but with what is, in my opinion, the strongest driver pairing on the grid, and a car that can now deliver the results, like I said, Red Bull might be in trouble. Which is exactly why Red Bull needs to kick Sergio Perez to the curb.